Isaiah 45, and I'll read the first seven verses. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, to subdue nations before him and to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him, that gates may not be closed. I will go before, I will go before you and level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I name you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Well, this chapter uh, continues uh, the end of the last chapter, uh, focusing on uh, Cyrus and his role. But as the chapter continues, it's very clear that, yes, the Lord is using Cyrus, but God, uh, the Lord, is the true uh, savior. Uh, Cyrus here is named by God and uh, uh, this uh, prophecy that Isaiah gives would have been 150 years uh, before Cyrus existed. And uh, again, I, as we saw in the last chapter, that, that is a proof of God's uh, sovereignty, of his uh, being the true God, that he can declare what is going to come so far in advance. And this is not the only place it happens in the Bible. Uh, Josiah is named in 1 Kings 13, hundreds of years before uh, he existed. It is a sign of God's greatness and his power. Now Cyrus is addressed, but his words are primarily for those who uh, waited for his arrival on Babylon, in Babylon uh, to uh, bring about the redemption of God's uh, people. And it's very striking the way that he's uh, described. Uh, verse 1, uh, that the Lord uh, says to his anointed, to Cyrus, uh, that idea of anointing, um, that's Messiah language in, um, in the Old Testament. And typically we would associate that with David and his line. Uh, but rather than David and his line, which we know as we read um, 1 and 2 Kings, uh, kind of ended in um, apostasy and turning away from God, uh, God is going to use this pagan king as his anointed to deliver his people. But even here, uh, from what we've read in Isaiah, we know that this is a uh, Cyrus is a temporary Messiah, and that we are waiting for the servant of the Lord. Uh, chapter forty-two. Uh, but even here, uh, Cyrus uh, uh, does have uh, a mission for God's people. At the end of the last chapter, chapter forty-four, verse twenty-eight, uh, he's described as a shepherd again. This kind of very strong uh, language. Uh, he will fulfill all my purpose. And what's he going to do? He's going to rebuild Jerusalem and rebuild uh, the temple. And uh, that's, uh, as we read uh, in the later uh, parts of the Old Testament, as Cyrus uh, makes his edict and God's people come back, Cyrus is responsible for the, the, the reestablishment of Jerusalem and uh, the temple. And this first part of chapter 45 underlines that he's going to do it uh, with uh, God's help. Verse 2 I will go before you and level the exalted places. At verse 3, I will give you uh, treasures of uh, darkness. And uh, he will do that so that Cyrus himself will know that God is the God of Israel. Uh, uh, end of verse 3. He'll do it for the sake of God's people, not for his own glory. Verse 4, for the sake of my servant, um, I call you by your name. And uh, he will do it so that all people uh, will know uh, that God alone is uh, God. And uh, that's the idea. It's not just Cyrus uh, will know verse 3, but it's so that everyone will know verse 5. I am the Lord and there is no other. I am the one who equips you. And so uh, the response of God acting through Cyrus uh, is there in verse 8. Uh, uh, Isaiah calls on the heavens themselves uh, to bring forth righteousness and the earth itself uh, to bring forth salvation and righteousness. This kind of wonderfully pictorial language is sort of saying, look, as, as God achieves his purposes through this strange savior, Cyrus, this pagan king, um, the earth will be put to right. And so this salvation that's happening through Cyrus 
points forward to that greater salvation uh, that lies in uh, the future. But verses 9 to 13 uh, strike a little bit of a darker note, and it talks about, um, uh, well, verse 9, Woe to him who strives with him who forms him, a pot among earthen pots. Does the clay say to him who forms it, What are you making? Or uh, your work has no handles. Woe to him who says to his father, what are you beginning? It's, it's talking about this idea of uh, a pot saying to the potter, why are you making me this way? Or a, or a son saying to a father, why are you kind of uh, making me this way? It's, it's absurd. Uh, what's it doing here? Well, I think it's, it's, um, it's a warning to Israel. Uh, Israel, you need to trust in my uh, means of salvation, even though it looks strange to you. Using a pagan king like Cyrus might look strange to you, but this is my way of doing things, and you need to trust that I am uh, God. You need to trust, verse 12, that I am the creator God. I made the earth and created man in it. It was me who stretched out the heavens and commanded all their hosts. And so it is me, verse 13, who has stirred Cyrus up. I think the hymn there is Cyrus. Cyrus up in righteousness. I will make his ways level. He'll build my city. He'll set my exiles free, not for price or reward. It's because I'm, I'm controlling. I'm, I'm calling the shots. I'm doing it. So uh, Israel, you need to trust me that this is my way of salvation. And uh, the, the rest of the chapter 14 to 25 reflects on that, that God himself, even though he's using Cyrus, God is the true uh, savior. And uh, the structure of this, uh, Barry Webb uh, points out, is uh, two speeches with responses by um, uh, Isaiah. So the first speech is there in uh, verse 14. Um, it's a speech by, uh, sorry, it's a, it's a speech by God saying uh, those who are scattered will come back and they'll bring um, uh, the, the, the good things of uh, the nations and the nations themselves will recognize. Uh, end of verse 15, there is no uh, other God besides him. And uh, 15 to 17 Isaiah responds uh, with amazement uh, that God himself, verse 17, is uh, bringing everlasting salvation. And then uh, 18 to 24, God again underlines that he is the true God. He is the one, verse 18, who created the heavens. Uh, verse 21, uh, imagine a, a, a case, uh, a, a courtroom where God was uh, on trial and he's challenging anyone to, again, declare uh, the future, explain the world, and uh, no one can do it. And so, uh, verse 23, turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. So again, this salvation of Israel from exile by Cyrus has implications for the whole world because it demonstrates, just like the original Exodus uh, from Egypt demonstrated that God is the true God, this return from exile demonstrates that God is the true God. And so, there should be uh, uh, trusting in uh, him. And you can see that picture, verse 23, to me, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. And then the last two verses kind of hold out the two uh, possibilities, either shame, um, uh, if, if you refuse uh, God, then you will be ashamed. But if you turn to him, verse 25, um, it will be uh, justification and glorying in, in, in God. So a shame or being put in a right relationship with God. Uh, this is uh, God's wonderful salvation of Israel. But even as it uh, speaks of his salvation of Israel, the deliverance of Israel from the exile uh, through the hand of Cyrus, it points beyond it uh, to the Lord Jesus. You know, if Cyrus was regarded as a strange savior, uh, the Lord Jesus um, who Isaiah will later tell us had no majesty uh, to attract us uh, uh, to him. He was rejected by his people. In, in that sense, he is a strange uh, savior. Uh, but then that language at the end of verse 23 of every knee bowing, every tongue confessing, that is applied by Paul in Philippians 2 to uh, the Lord Jesus. So yes, uh, Jesus in a sense fulfills the role of Cyrus, but he also fulfills the role of God. Uh, he is the divine savior uh, who will save his people. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus who fulfills uh, your purposes as shown in this chapter. He is your savior, even though the world rejects him. And we know that one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. And we thank and praise you in his name. Amen.